The Greater New Bedford Community Health Center monthly video series is brought to you by Senior Whole Health, a health plan for seniors that have both Medicare and Mass Health coverage. Online at seniorwholehealth.com. Welcome to the Greater New Bedford Community Health Center. We will be presenting a series of seminars which we hope will inform the community and our staff about the benefits which are available to the people that we serve. Thank you for having us and I'll introduce uh, Ellen McCabe, has been a hospice nurse for over 20 years. She's palliative certified and she is our director of education and will be speaking on the road we're all on, dispelling the myths of hospice. So I'll hand it over to Ellen. Hi, nice to see you guys today. Uh, when we look at uh, the name of this program, which is The Road We're All On, um, I think that very often we think of uh, planning for the times in our lives where we're going to experience serious illness or there might be something sudden that comes into the picture that we're not expecting. We tend to have to do a lot of crisis management. We respond in a crisis rather than have the planning that sometimes we require to take a trip or to make a significant purchase. Sometimes we have more planning involved than the decisions surrounding um, what we will do if we can't speak for ourselves and who do we want to speak for us. So we're going to talk about um, this road that we're all on in terms of uh, what Nancy had suggested um, first, which was defining hospice care and palliative care. That can be kind of confusing, and we'll talk about the differences between those two um, philosophies of care. Um, we'll discuss some common myths. We'll talk about why a team approach to care is really important in terms of uh, when we experience a serious illness, we rarely experience it uh, by ourselves. Our families certainly experience the impact of uh, that illness right along with us. Not in the same way that we experience it, but right along with us. So why do we need a team approach to care? Because uh, serious illness is not just what's happening with us physically, but what's happening with us spiritually, psychosocially, and psychologically. So um, we'll talk a little bit about payment um, so this is a little bit of a background uh, about hospice care. Uh, when, when it was first uh, brought to the United States, it came from England. Um, Dane Cicely Saunders, who uh, was first a nurse, uh, then a doctor, and then a social worker. Um, she noticed that the level of care that people received as they were close to death was um, not a level of care she was proud of. In um, England, um, which still exists today, uh, there's ward nursing so that, that if you were in a hospital, you would be on a ward and just like in our, what we would consider common in our emergency rooms where the rooms are separated by a curtain, um, that in England, that's the way people uh, did receive all of their care by that, just that thin curtain between the rooms. Uh, what they typically did because um, you had all different levels of care, the people that were dying were pushed to the very, very back of the room. And behind a curtain, they were isolated. They frequently had symptoms that weren't addressed because nobody really saw them. They weren't right out in front of them. They didn't use their call bells a lot because they couldn't. And so that people would die alone and suffering the symptoms uh, and not getting even palliative treatments to make them more comfortable. So when this came to the United States um, for many years, it was not a funded program. Um, just like our hospice um, did 30 years ago, and there's um, a handful of programs that still exist in Massachusetts that are the same as us. We were born as a volunteer hospice. That meant that 100% of the care that was given by the staff was paid for by the pockets of the community in terms of their donations. And uh, in about the mid 80s, uh, the Medicare hospice benefit was passed. And now there was a funding stream to pay for the care that was provided. Um, and it has and is to this day the most economical uh, delivery of care system that is in the United States. Um, it's cost effective. It requires 5% um, of our total 
Labor has to be volunteer, so non-paid staff, which also makes it a big economic um, uh, windfall for uh, Medicare system. And uh, with all of that said, Massachusetts is 37th in the country in terms of our use of hospice and palliative care. Sometimes they credit the excellent care that's available in Boston as a big reason for that. You know, they're, that not, and I don't mean this um, facetiously that nobody dies in Boston, but there are a, a number of things that uh, if this doesn't work, there's something else that they can offer you that prevents people from seeing hospice care as a viable option. Um, maybe after they go home, but if they die in the hospital, um, they aren't going to ever receive that care. Um, in uh, Massachusetts, you can receive hospice care wherever you call home. So whether you are in a skilled nursing facility for long-term care, whether you're um, at home, whether you live in an assisted living, whether you live in a group home, whether you're in a hospital, um, you can actually sign on to hospice now while you're in the hospital. And um, so your care is going to be directed a little bit differently than somebody else that comes through the emergency room a different way. Um, why hospice matters, and I think the reason, um, even governmentally, the changes that are coming um, this way through um, the federal government, through Medicare, through Medicaid, it says that um, beyond the philosophical great reasons to do hospice, um, there's also a lot of monetary um, support. Um, hospice, um, and this is through a Medicaid, um, the Center for um, Medicaid, uh, when they put out their statistics, the CMS statistics, uh, hospice benefit saves Medicare 50 cents on every dollar. Um, why is that? Maybe because people are starting to limit the treatments that they get once they sign into hospice. Um, we are an open door hospice. Not every hospice is an open door hospice. But um, even with our open door, which means that uh, the federal government, the guidelines for hospice eligibility, um, which there's a slide that addresses this in a minute, uh, says that you need two things, a physician to say that you're eligible for the care and that you want the care. They don't put any guidelines on what treatments you can or can't have. Hospices do, however, and part of it is being able to stay fiscally above water. Um, some of it is based on a philosophy within that hospice organization. So for us, we're open door, meaning that you don't have to give up your treatments to go into hospice. It means you can still have radiation, you can still have dialysis, you can be on chemotherapy. You don't have to identify that it is for palliation, but I will say, that the physician, when they say you're eligible, everything they're doing is palliative. Because they say, if today, if nothing changes, we think you're eligible for this type of care, it really means that, that those treatments are not changing the course of your illness. And that's going to get us into our, our definitions of what palliative is versus hospice. Um, what I will say is that um, the only thing that maybe differentiates us is do not need to stop treatments, but everything else says pretty much all hospices would be offering that under the hospice benefit. Um, the difference between the words palliative care and hospice care. Palliative care is def defined as care that offers comfort and support without the ability to change the course of disease. So I technically, if I went and had my knee redone, I don't have a terminal illness, and I, there's nothing malignant in my knee that needs to be replaced, that uh, when they offer me pain management so that I can get up and moving so I can attend therapy, that's palliative care. It's not really physically changing the course of my illness. I've had surgery, they've repaired what was wrong, but palliative care, can be offered to people with chronic pain syndromes, again, without end of life attached. They can be for arthritis. Um, the moment you're diagnosed with heart failure, if you do not have a heart transplant, all of the measures that will be offered to you will be palliative. That's the only way that you would fix that illness is if you had a heart transplant. 
Um, Alzheimer's disease, a disease that typically might run its course over uh, 10 to 15 years. From the moment you're diagnosed with that, it is a terminal illness. There is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Is it limited to six months or less? Not for many, many years. All of the care that you receive is palliative. The Aricept, Ixalan, Razodyne, Nemenda, all of that's palliative. It can't change the course of the disease, but it helps people perform better in windows of time. So palliative care programs are based on that palliative is a philosophy of care. There's not really a reimbursement stream for it. Um, the current reimbursement stream that is utilized under palliative care is typically skilled home health. So you ha still have to meet the qualifications for skilled home health care. Um, and those are just a, a basic um, provision in terms of that you need to meet homebound criteria. Um, medications, treatments related to the serious illness um, I have traditional coverage. So if you use your um, Medicare um, Part D, or if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield and they have an HMO um, formulary that you follow and you pay a copay, all those things would still apply. Um, therapies have to still have to have achievable goals. So there has to be a goal for physical therapy to be in there, and it has that, that, that um, if the goals run into a wall where they're not able to get any further, then palliative care typically wouldn't be able to continue, and possibly at that point, skilled home health would make a referral to the hospice program. Um, NHPCO does have statistics that say almost all the people that are in palliative care are hospice eligible. It's upwards of 90%. The average length of stay for somebody in palliative care is about four months. And it is typically, not those other examples I gave, but typically it's people who are still getting treatment for their cancer or still on dialysis or still um, at a very interventional stage of their illness. Um, they typically are not the five and ten years out, those people would still not qualify because they need to make those, um, need to meet uh, homebound criteria. Um, the wonderful thing about palliative care that is a bonus after, you know, I realize I've talked about what it doesn't do, but what it does do is offer a focused um, care that tries to, as much as it can be, team focus on the care, comfort, and support of someone who's experiencing serious illness. What hospice offers families is an all-encompassed uh, plan of care. 100% of the care hospice does is palliative. So not all pal palliative care is hospice care, but 100% of hospice care is palliative care. Um, the goals are patient and family self-identified goals and we work from there. So um, maybe somebody doesn't have an achievable goal around ambulation, but the patient and family have determined that's important for their quality of life, that dad try to figure out a way that he can ambulate safely within the house and prevent falls. We would cover physical therapy because the patient and family have self-identified that that's an important goal for them. Our goals are going to be around the patient and family versus discipline specific. I say you should be able to do this and, and that's what I'm working towards. Um, that uh, patients and families maintain hope. Their hope changes, it shifts. They maintain hope based on their needs being met at the time that they are shifting. So that initially maybe somebody was hoping for a cure or maybe they were hoping they didn't have what they had. Maybe they were hoping the CAT scan was wrong and I don't have cancer. But along the way, that hope shifts from, I hope I'm comfortable, I hope my family's okay, I hope that I have enough support to be able to stay in my home or wherever I call home. I hope that my life has had meaning and purpose. I mean, our, 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 our hope shifts when we're given new information to base um, life care decisions on. At some point, if I left this room today and I found out that my life was shorter than I thought it was, 
I hope that I would have that opportunity to redefine what living well means to me. Because I could be on a crazy gerbil wheel of family and parents and children and uh, community or um, obligations and my job. But I guarantee you if I suddenly found out that my life was a lot shorter than I thought it was, I would take stock and say, this goes, this will never go. I'll always want to hold on to this piece. These things, they'll find somebody else to do those because I want to shift my energy somewhere else. That's what people that are offered hospice do. They take stock and they're able to reevaluate their lives in the face of serious illness. Um, so when we look at the goals of care and what they are based on, um, the focus is on reintegration of people uh, away from their serious illness. Does that make sense? Um, I'll tell you a, a quick story. When I was in nursing school, I remember um, it was pre-post-it notes, okay, because that's how old I am. <laughs> but I was handed a sheet of paper, maybe about this size, and the nurse that was handing off to me, there was emergency on the floor, and all of the staff was in a certain room. I think the patient had... Um, um, a code going on, so somebody had um, the need for resuscitation, et cetera. And she said, you have a breast cancer in 203 and a GI bleed in 205. And at that young age, I remember thinking, boy, I hope I am never identified by my most ill body part. <laughs> like, I hope that I am never a breast cancer or a GI bleed, because I'm so much more than that. And so what hospice really focuses on is to say, who was I pre-illness? What parts of that are, are intrinsic to who I am and what makes me me? So it is about building those pieces back together. And, and believe me, when I'm in the hospital and I have a problem with my gallbladder, you can think of me as a gallbladder. Because you know what, if you have the capability of fixing my gallbladder, more power to you. If my gallbladder isn't fixable, then let it go and honor who I am and what I love and what I don't love and what I'm passionate about. If I have Alzheimer's disease and can no longer communicate who I am, hopefully you'll listen to the people that love me and that are around me and they tell you what I dreamed of, what I hoped for, what I was passionate about, what I hated, what I loved, what, I, what comforted me, what made me frightened. I hope that people would always be able to see me who I was pre-illness. And so that's what we try to model for our patients and families too, who start to separate from who people were and focus on their illness. It's about reintegrating that person to who they are pre-illness. Um, when we look at what hospice care encompasses, the patient and the family are the unit of care. And again, this is something that applies to any hospice. Um, we are bound to provide care, and this is under Medicare, and most private insurances also encompass the same philosophy of care, which says we are bound under that reimbursement and under the philosophy of care to provide care for the patient and whoever they call family. They don't have to be blood relatives. They can be a circle of care that are made up of friends that, per, that are that person's um, rock. Um, but we provide care, and we have to fine tune it. Because initially, when um, people aren't actively dying, people can be on the same path. Their goals are the same. Patient and family can't really tell the difference between those goals. They are the same. As death approaches, sometimes those goals diverge. I still want to be comfortable. I don't want the person I love to die. So we still have to look creatively of how do we support both of those different parties with maybe differing goals as um, end of life approaches. So we have to use more than just a nurse, more than just a doctor. We need to have a whole team of people whose expertise is to round out what makes a person a person. Their spirituality, again, spirituality is different than religion. 
Um, spirituality is that sense of meaning and purpose in life. It's what connects us with our legacy, what connects us to um, our personal beliefs around death and what happens after death, or maybe nothing happens after death. But those personal truths, values, um, the base of our ethical, our, code, our personal code of ethics are supported by these other team members. So we have um, an interdisciplinary team that supports that care. Different than a multidisciplinary team that would be in skilled home health, where you'd have several dis different dis disciplines, but each one has their own goal for what the patient can possibly achieve. In hospice care, we're all in the same crammed car, and we're set on the path that the patient and family have determined. So we have to be creative about how to work with one another and how to keep the patient and family present in that, that core um, uh, goals of care. So these are all the people that might make up a team. Uh, we had a patient, uh, this was my patient a couple years ago, and she was a hospice patient who had a um, terminal diagnosis of cancer. And I came to her house one day and she said, you know, Alan, and I'm really upset today because I found out today I could have had hospice two months ago. And I, we had a very good relationship and I said, oh, Marianne, most people aren't sad that they, didn't, they weren't offered hospice two months ago. And she said, I'm serious. And I, I happened to really like the doctor that managed her care, and I said something stupid, which I wish I could have taken back the minute I said it. I said, oh, Dr. So-and-so, he's so good and he's so compassionate, he probably didn't want you to lose hope. And you know what, Marianne, she jumped right on that. And she said, how is he to know what my hope is? She said, I'll tell you one thing. If he thinks that he was hiding the fact that I was dying, nobody did a very good job. Because for the last month and a half, every time I've gone to my appointments at the oncology center, people offer me a chair, they offer me the most comfortable bed, they're very solicitous, get me something to drink, something to make me more comfortable. She said the hugs last longer. The, the offers of support and wondering how my family is doing are more extensive than they were two months ago. She said, I knew I was doing poorly. Beyond that, I was failing physically. She said, I'll tell you what a typical day was for me two months ago. I go to the cancer center. I usually have a 10-minute appointment. For that 10-minute appointment, it took about two hours at home with frequent rest breaks to get just a bath done. She said, I pr pretty much leave the bathroom exhausted, soaking wet, go into the kitchen to see if there was something that I could pull together while I finished uh, drying off and, and getting dressed. She said, I'd see a dish strainer full of dishes, my house unkempt, and I'd lose my appetite. I'd go in my bedroom, I'd get dressed, and I thought, if I need to, I'll pick up something on, on the way back from my appointment. She said, I would get to my appointment. I'd have my 10-minute appointment. I'd go back into my car, turn the key, cry for about a half hour, and drive back home to a house that was unkept, to a garden that I once loved that was overgrown. And I thought to myself, I'm not in this anymore. I, 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 if this is what living is, I'm not interested. I wish it would just be over with. Because live, die, whatever, this isn't the life that I want. She said, then hospice came in, and she made, an, she made a point of saying this like right in the beginning. She goes, and Ellen, if you think you're the star of this story, you're not. I love you, we laugh together, but really, the stars of the story are an unpaid person and probably two of the, the least paid people at hospice. And so she went on to say, that a home health aide comes in three times a week and helps her with her bath. She said, that might sound simple to you, but frankly, on those days, I relax. I don't lose my appetite. I don't get nauseous because I know somebody is going to be with me for that period of time, that hour, and they're going to help me get ready. They're also, while I'm drying off, 
cleaning the bathroom, putting everything back in order, throwing a load of towels in. They lotioned me in places that I couldn't reach before I got sick. And when I get dressed, I come out into the kitchen, the dish drainer is cleared of dishes, and a light meal has been prepared for me. So the home health aid is not just doing my bath, they're making that day a brighter day for me. She said then, I also have a homemaker, which I couldn't even imagine that a, a medical benefit would include someone that might do light housekeeping. She said, two months ago, I had several friends that I'm very close to offer to come over, want to keep me company, want to share something with me, and I would make up an excuse for why it wasn't a good day for them to come over. She said, the reality was I was ashamed. I was ashamed of the way my house looked. Now I have a homemaker, she comes in once a week. My house is cleaner than before I got sick. She kind of made a joke. She said, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> but she said, now when somebody calls, I don't say not today. I say, absolutely, I'd love to have you come over. She said, they might get suspicious when they're always coming over on Thursdays and my, my homemaker comes on Wednesday, so the house is looking the best. But she said, again, it's a reason for me to stay around because my life has more quality today than it did two months ago. She said the third thing is a volunteer, someone that's not even paid. She has never once asked me how my disease treatment is going. She doesn't ask me what my bowel movements look like. She doesn't, excuse me for the community. <laughs> um, she doesn't ask me um, medical driven questions. She asked me about what I'm passionate about, which was my garden. We, she helps me out to the garden. I pull one weed for her 50, and she turns around and tells me what a great gardener I am. She said, I have pride, I have dignity, and I sure as heck have meaning and purpose right now, and I'm in this life for every second I have left. You know, the beauty of that is that that is, says that that care was successful. We've successfully moved away from disease modification into a palliative type of care that builds back meaning and purpose to people's lives. And truly, um, she was a passionate, artistic person. And she had lost hope because her life wasn't what she wanted it to be. And this enabled her life to be, you know, she still had me asking about her bowel movements and rating her pain. But the good thing was is that most of the people going in the house weren't asking those things. So some of the myths about hospice care. Um, and again, this is primarily the same for all hospices. These myths would be true for all hospices, with the exception of giving up treatments. Um, primarily for hospice or cancer patients only. Um, about 60% of the patients we serve have non-cancer diagnoses. They have heart failure, um, cardiopulmonary diseases, um, uh, obstructive pulmonary diseases like COPD. They have heart failure, ALS, MS, other neuromuscular diseases like Scheidraegers or um, supranuclear palsy. Uh, they have Alzheimer's disease or associated dementias. Um, there, Medicare even has a disease group called Debility Unspecified, which is an adult failure to thrive, which says we don't know what the terminal cause of this person's decline is, but they're losing weight, they're sleeping more, they're less mobile, they need more assistance, they need more skilled intervention, and all of those things put together says patient is more likely than not, if nothing changes, if the disease runs its normal course, to die in the next six months, and they're eligible for care under that disease group. So some of our patients don't even have a typical disease that drives their care. They have a compilation of health scenarios. Um, I will also say one myth that's not up here is that actually not all hospice patients die. There is a small portion of hospice patients who come into hospice because of those circumstances, but it's really because there's a huge lacking support somewhere in their life. 
and maybe they weren't safe at home and they moved to a facility and in that facility they have 24-hour care, they have somebody monitoring their medications, they're going to activities and now they're gaining weight, they're more mobile, they're getting a little bit of therapy and they actually, their condition isn't terminal. It was the fact that they were in, living independently and not safe in their own environment that was really causing their decline. They didn't have enough strength to make their own meals and they needed somebody to do that for them. Um, for patients that have chosen to die, uh, that's a big myth even within the family situation that they don't want to bring up hospice because they don't want somebody to lose hope or uh, they don't want somebody to give up. Disease will run its normal course. Once we've gotten to a point where we can't modify the path, disease will run its course no matter what we do. Uh, so it's definitely not for people who have chosen to die. In fact, um, People sometimes say to, to those of us who have worked in hospice for a long time, they say, oh, that must be really sad work. I have to say, none of my patients are dying. They're all living the best life they can for the amount of time they have left. Sometimes they're living more in this phase of their life than they lived in the last couple of years because somebody has focused their care on those things that mean something to them. So um, that, I think, is a big myth that people have uh, given up or, or chosen to die. They have to be homebound or bedbound. Uh, when I was in Milwaukee, I worked um, for a hospice, and my, um, the, the CEO of our company, she had an elderly gen gentleman um, behind a boat barefoot um, water skiing. And underneath, she had the caption, you don't have to be homebound to be hospice. <laughs> and the point was, certainly, I wouldn't say my uh, patients are barefoot water skiing, but they, if, a, if a patient ever called me and said, Ellen, I know you're supposed to be here this morning, but Joe and I have decided to go to the park instead, I couldn't have a happier thing happen to me, that my hospice patient wouldn't want to be at home, but would want to be doing something with their family outside the home, it's a beautiful thing. So people don't have to kind of go beyond the um, pale in terms of staying in their homes. We hope that people would be able to be out, and we facilitate it. We've facilitated people to be able to take trips. Um, I can tell you that um, about two years ago, we had a hospice patient, and she called me after she had an appointment with her doctor. And she was really upset because her sisters had planned to take her on a big trip. It had been a lifelong dream for all of them to take this trip. She was diagnosed with an end stage um, condition and she didn't have very much time left. She had pulmonary fibrosis and um, she now knew what the cause of her extreme shortness of breath was, but um, the doctor said it would be against medical advice to travel. So I went out with the social worker at the time and we talked about, um, first of all, how disappointed she was. And I called the physician back to say, what if we find out what the worst case scenarios of this taking this trip are? Would you support her if we could figure out enough of these things? He said, absolutely. He said, I just felt like it's ridiculous to think that somebody who's hospice, who's you know, got two months to live, could go and take this big trip. So the big trip was she wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands. And she wanted to take this trip with her three sisters. So our first question was, what would be the worst thing that could happen? And the patient herself, Claire, said, well, it wouldn't be the worst thing for me, but it would for them. And they all kind of chuckled, and she said, I would die down there. And I said, okay. So we're gonna have to call the, cons the U.S. consulate in the Galapagos Islands and find out what happens when a U.S. citizen dies down there. So that was number one on our list. Okay, so then they said, and how would we get her back home? So now, like, the patient's right there, and we're talking actively about what would happen when she dies, if she dies down there. So we found out that it was um, cheaper to have her cremated down there and bring her ashes back, and that could be done in a pretty short time frame. Um, we found out, then the 
patient kind of chirped back up and she said, well, what if I don't die but need some, something for my shortness of breath? So how would she get medications? How would she access oxygen, et cetera? We got all the questions answered, went back to the physician. He said, absolutely, I'll write whatever she needs in terms of prescriptions. I still don't think it's a great idea, but if they're bound and determined, she took the trip with her sisters. She, her sisters scuba dived. She did not scuba dive, but she snorkeled with sea turtles. And she came home and she died about three weeks later. So she hadn't done any of those things. She wasn't homebound. She, she did have to sign off for hospice when she was in the Galapagos Islands, because Medicare is not going to cover her down there. But um, she even was within a couple of weeks to the end of her life. But that dream was a big, huge piece of her sisters having peace with their sister dying well bef before old age. That was an opportunity for them in bereavement to look back and say, we pulled out all the stops and we did what we wanted to do. We seized the day. Um, pa benefits patients when days, hours left. Um, you certainly get benefit even when you get called two days before you die and you bring hospice in because they can, they can age at home. They can stay where they're in their environment and they can be cared for with some support. Is that ideal? No. And the median length of stay in Massachusetts for hospice care um, really says somebody might only be on a couple of weeks. It says half the people would die within a couple of weeks, half might live longer. So somebody might live a year, but we also have patients, and it just happened last week, where somebody died during the admission visit. So the averages, the law of averages, is somewhere in between that. Um, who doesn't benefit when we are called when hours are left is the family, because they are going this road alone. They're relying on the emergency room and other means to try to keep their loved one comfortable. They constantly are questioning, did they do the right thing? Should they have done more? Somebody else told them they should have done this. Somebody told them they should do this. Again, if you don't have the opportunity to look at things differently, sometimes um, you don't. And so uh, I would say not everybody benefits when we're called right at the end. Um, hospice means giving up hope. Like I said, um, Mary Ann ended up writing a letter to her physician and she said, at first I hoped I didn't have cancer. Then I hoped you'd offer me a treatment. When that didn't work, I hoped you'd have something else up your sleeve. Then I hoped I could sleep through the night. Then I hoped I didn't have pain. Then I hoped my family would be okay when I die. And now I hope I ha my life has had meaning and that when I die, something about the life I've lived contributed to the world and will live beyond me. So her hope changed. She never gave up hope. I will say, too, um, we had a patient at the care center, um, and when he rolled in, he was this really strapping guy, almost unconscious, and his wife um, accompanied him. He had a big Marine Corps tattoo on his shoulder, so I knew he was a serviceman. I always wanted to make it a point to say thank you to anybody you know, who had served um, our country. And through that, she said, yeah, I guess Joe's finally given up. And I said, could I sit down on the couch with you? Because I want to share something with you. And um, what I said was that disease will take our lives regardless of how f hard we fight it. And I said, I don't want you to think, and he probably wouldn't want you to think that he's given up. Um, people don't die because they give up. They die because their disease runs its course. And she started to cry, and she said, I'm so relieved you said that because he's a strong guy, and he wouldn't think, well, he would associate giving up with weakness. And I said, when people stop eating, it's not because they've given up. It's because their body is sending them a stronger message that this is not going to help. So it's, it's important to make people um, aware that um, giving up for the patient who's dying is almost an, it interferes with their dignity. It really does. 
because people are trying the hard, the hardest they can to stay with the people they love and, and to be with the things they love and to do the things they love. Um, hospice is not a single organization. Um, within this service area, there's probably about 11 hospices that service this area. So not all hospices have the same rules and not all hospices have the same admission criteria. Um, uh, some hospices won't care for children. That's again not a federal regulation or tied to insurance. It's tied to their admission criteria. So if you get a turn down from one hospice, I would recommend calling another hospice just to get a second opinion, just like you would for any other medical treatment. Um, you have to choose not to be resuscitated um, if you want hospice care. Um, we have several people in our program that are not DNRs. Some hospices might say that, but the federal government sends us a letter on a yearly basis to say you cannot limit somebody's access to hospice because they've chosen to be resuscitated. So it's confusing. It's confusing when the ambulance comes. It's confusing when you show up in the emergency room and the physician might say, why are they here? They're on hospice. Why do they want to be resuscitated? It's a futile treatment. There is nothing that says somebody has to choose to be not resuscitated. Do we talk about it? Absolutely. Because at the end, it isn't about if you are going to die or if you're going to live, it's about where you're going to die. So we do want to say, if you want to be at home or in your environment when you die, then you would choose not to be resuscitated. If you want to die in the hospital and you feel like that's the place where your family is going to get the support, then you can choose to be resuscitated. Um, the reality is when you are resuscitated at end of life, when you have a terminal condition, that 6% of people that arrest in a clinical environment can be resuscitated. Um, two weeks after that resuscitation, do you know how many leave the hospital? None. So we really do talk to people a lot about resuscitation and what it means to them. But it's important not to badger people because sometimes it does, especially for certain cultures and faith traditions, it might interfere with their hope if you push them to be a DNR and they're not ready to do that. But it's important to know that's not a requirement of hospice. Um, and then this is the differentiator, but it's not just our hospice. Some hospices have different levels of treatments you can continue. Like if somebody says that they need palliative radiation or a transfusion, some hospices might approve that. I think that we're the only one that has the open door philosophy that says regardless of what the treatment is, we can offer that support. Um, who's eligible to receive hospice services? People have to just meet these two requirements. So the physician has to attest that in their best guess, um, the patient is more likely than not, if the disease runs its normal course, to die in the next six months. That's the Medicare language. The second requirement is that the patient and family want hospice. So I've kind of already talked about this. Individual hospices may set their own criteria for admission. Um, sometimes people will say you have to have a caregiver. Some will say you have to be a DNR. Some say you have to refuse hospitalization. Some say you have to promise that you won't want IVs. Some might say um, that you can't call 911. None of all those things are rules of the individual hospice. Um, and most of them are guidelines, not rules. Like I know in, in, I have a good friend that works in a program who says people are not supposed to call 911, but I know that they don't really discharge them or they discharge them at the ER and then they readmit them. Um, we don't draw any lines because people get scared. And if you imagine the level of care somebody needs as they're dying, either in a skilled environment or at home, that it is scary when people are all by themselves and they're the sole caregiver. What they don't want to do is make a mistake. They don't want somebody to come along later and say, oh my god, why didn't you call so-and-so? We hope they'll call us first, but if they don't call us first, we'll meet them at the emergency room. And a lot of hospices probably would do that too, although I don't know for sure. But we do meet every single one of our patients that calls 911, we meet them at the 
hospital so that we can communicate the plan of care to the emergency staff, but also to support the patient and family because whatever crisis they experienced, um, you know, they felt the need to do that. Um, whom do we serve? Anyone who's eligible. And again, that is true of anyone. They might have different admission criteria, but um, in terms of um, eligibility, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we also care for anybody who's a, a experiencing the serious impact of uh, grief and loss. And most hospices also have a community bereavement program where they do that, where they support people who have lost somebody. You don't have to have had somebody die in hospice to get support through one of these community programs. Um, and, all, and of course, the ability to pay. No, we no, I don't believe any hospice um, will turn someone down. We certainly have cared for people without Social Security numbers. Um, the, the eligibility is a medical eligibility, not a guarantee for payment, if that makes sense. Um, We've talked a little bit about the need for early referrals and how that helps um, the t for people to get the full benefit of care. Um, ideally, they would have at least two months of hospice care prior to their death. Um, the quicker you die after entrance to hospice, it's, it tends to be the two most intensive times for patients when they're offered hospice and when they die. And if both of those things happen within the two, same two week period, it can be traumatic for the patients and families, even if they've lived a long time with that illness. Um, in Massachusetts, every insurance carrier is required to offer a hospice benefit. Are they all created equal? No. Um, but um, they all have varying degree of levels of care. The top insurance uh, carriers have something that pretty well mimics the M Medicare hospice benefit, which is split up into a couple of different levels of care. Um, so home care, routine home care, inpatient care for symptoms out of control, and we might have somebody go to the care center or to the hospital for that level of care. Um, respite, every family is entitled to five days of respite. Um, as often as they need it to get a break from caregiving so that they could continue to do that caregiving. That's usually not offered to people in skilled nursing environments because um, they're being reimbursed in a different way for that care. Um, and then um, continuous care, which is like the inpatient benefit in a hospital, but it's in somebody's home. So somebody says they're refusing hospitalization, but they have a symptom out of control. We might have nurses in the house continuously to make that uh, symptom go away or to be managed. And then um, that benefit's usually um, limited to getting that symptom under control. The Medicare hospice benefit doesn't have a room and board portion. If there's anybody in here that provides services, uh, service support, helping people navigate insurance. So um, routine home care, even in a skilled environment, requires an additional pay source for room and board. If they're on the inpatient benefit because they have a symptom out of control, that's wholly covered by the hospice. So the room and board is covered in that place. And also with respite, it's covered at 100%, but routine home care requires um, uh, private pay, mass health backup, something like that. How does uh, the Medicare benefit differ from traditional Medicare? Medicare hospice benefit covers only the um, diagnosis that is causing the terminal illness. So anything else that you have happen would be covered under your traditional Medicare if, if you're a Medicare recipient. So if somebody has COPD and was with hospice for their chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and they are up on a three-step ladder changing a light bulb, which actually happened to us, and fell and broke their hip, that person actually stayed on hospice for her lung disease, but went through her traditional Medicare for her hip, and her, she went through surgery. She suspended her DNR during the surgery and then re-attested re to it afterwards. She went to a skilled environment for her uh, Medicare skilled benefit for about three weeks. When she had had sort of enough of it, wanted to come back home, felt that she gained enough ground, um, she came home and she died about a month later. She was never not eligible for her lung disease. 
but the HIP was not related to, um, to uh, the benefit. Um, we cover medications, treatments, uh, equipment, durable medical equipment. All of that is covered at 100%. There's no cost to the patient or family. The medications do have to be related to the terminal illness. So if we have somebody who has um, congestive heart failure, but also has Synthroid for their thyroid condition, the thyroid condition medication would be covered the same way it normally would be. And um, this is the McCarthy Care Center where we provide um, a care alternative to hospitalization where you have round-the-clock nurses. Um, the skilled um, ratio for patients is um, one nurse to two patients. The, um, the rooms are all private, and um, so it's conducive to people who are going through end-of-life issues and need the privacy of uh, being able to work through those things at end-end-of-life. Um, it is for acute symptom management, so we follow the same discharge criteria that a hospital would. Um, some people do die there, um, but also some people go back to their care environment, uh, whatever that might be. Um, the rights of the seriously ill, again, they relate directly back to palliative care and what we offer. So we want to make sure that people's spiritual and psychological and psychosocial um, relationship um, issues are well supported. Um, I gave, um, there's a copy of the five wishes as you came in, and I'll give you extra copies if you need them. Uh, the five wishes is a tool. It shouldn't replace the healthcare proxy that is the state um, authorized form, but the five wishes um, talks about these kind of things that come up, and typically we only look at that at a crisis situation. We don't look at that when everybody's doing fine. And in fact, we just passed the national day for doing um, this kind of discussion, which is Thanksgiving. They figure if everybody's around the table and there's not a crisis attached, there's a better chance to say, who do I want to speak for me? Not just who do I want to speak for me, but for them to know what I mean that means to me. Um, it's very, it's, it's not uncommon that we choose a healthcare agent, but that agent is absolutely um, nervous and, and perhaps has not been communicated. What does that mean? My mom recently um, said to me after my dad died, she said, I hope that you're able to think with your 80 year old brain when you're speaking on my behalf. Think of someone who has had 30 plus years more life experience than you have had at your point in your life. Think about how you'd feel if you had lost your partner of 50 plus years. Think about um, having declining health situation where you're not immobile and you're not independent and you're living with one of your kids. She said, use that part of your brain to make decisions for me because I guarantee you my decisions are based on a whole different set of information than yours are. So that helped me to say I really could speak for her and not be nervous that um, my decisions might um, not go over well with other people because she said that's your job is to speak as if you were speaking for me. If I could sit up and look at what was happening, when you those words come out of your mouth, it's as if they were coming out of my mouth. So. Um, I look at how overwhelming this could seem. I think of this picture, it's a French, it's a, it's a lighthouse in France, and the gentleman rode a bike to work. <laughs> so you know that this is not in the middle of the ocean, and in fact, when he came out that door, they realized that this, the situation was dire, and he was, he was hearing a helicopter overhead that was taking this picture, actually not the rescue helicopter. But when he went in to work that day, did he know that this was going to happen, that there was all of a sudden a tidal wave was going to crash, and all your belongings and your relationships and everything was going to be interrupted? And that's what dying does to us. So it's not just a medical experience that your heart stops and you die. It's a human experience that has to do with how can we say goodbye to people? How can we make sure that we maintain dignity? Um, so there is spiritual work in terms of what the, spiritual, the, the um, person who is um, facing serious illness experiences. We try to honor all of these things. 
knowing that everyone is processes stuff individually, um, the cultural component in any healthcare situation is huge. And it is not tied to the color of my skin or my religious preference. It's probably the most highly influenced part of culture is how my family works. You know, and we don't think of it. We think about sexual orientation or gender or ethnicity. But sometimes culture is really how does my family process information. So I, we spend a lot of time addressing anticipatory grief and supporting patients who will survive the illness um, and death of their loved one. When we are caring for people that's Ill, that are ill, and I, this goes for all of us that are in this room, um, you have to care for yourselves. Um, when my dad was um, ill, I beat a path to the Midwest from Cape Cod. Um, I think I had gone five times in four months. And my budget, I guarantee you, did not support me flying once in that period of time. And, and yet, I was on my fifth trip. And I remembered, like I could say, I could pick up the card from the seat in front of me, and I could close my eyes, and I could have given that whole, sorry, airport speech, you know, the, the, that if the cabin loses pressure, an oxygen mask is going to drop, you're going to have the, the lights um, will light your way to the exits, which are located in the back, the front, and on the sides. But the thing that struck me that visit was this analogy that if the cabin would lose pressure, that I should put the oxygen on myself first before I would put it on somebody who needed assistance, like a child or an elderly or debilitated person. It reminds us that as caregivers, we have to care for ourselves first. Otherwise, the whole care situation will flop. So making sure that we recognize what our own limitations are. Um, we acknowledge the strengths of the people around us. We take opportunities to learn from others that when, we, when we can. Um, the lessons I've learned from my 20 plus years in hospice are a really solely not to how to avoid terminal illness, but how to live better. And so I guess I would just close with that, is to say, um, of all those lessons, making every day count and taking the opportunities that are afforded to us um, to, to, to get through the road we're all on. Thank you.